116 Board of Education on Thursday, March 8, 2012 at 7 p.m. in the Rowling High School Theater Band. Here. 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 Welcome to everyone. It is uh, great to see you here. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we, this is our second of three forums that we have scheduled this year. The first one was on facilities, which was back in October. And now we are doing this one this evening on finances. And we have a third one, which is scheduled next month on teaching and learning. So we would invite you to come back again at that time and bring someone else with you. Uh, we're going to begin by having um, Mr. Bill Johnston, as well as Mr. Jay Kahn, uh, do a presentation for us. The presentation will take about an hour, and after the presentation, then we want to open it up for about 30 minutes for any questions or any comments that you may have. And so just thank you again for being here, and at this time, we're going to get started. Thank you, Dr. Collins, and the Board of Education. This evening, we're going to cover. We're going to cover three things. We're going to talk about school finance in general. Maybe give you a little background on what school finance is. Then we'll talk about the last 20 years here in Round Lake, and then conclude by talking about our development of next year's budget. And so I'm going to at this point turn it over to Jay, who's going to give you the first component. Hello, I'm Jay Kahn, Director of Fiscal Services. I'm just talking to you a little bit about school finance and background in general, so you have some basis for understanding the state of schools, our district's finances. Um, in the private sector, people are more familiar with it, corporations, sales are based, or revenues are based on sales. So it's delivering products or goods, and um, they are dependent on sales. It's based on supply and demand, so they're pretty very low and hard to predict. Uh, public sector is different. Governments and schools, revenues are based on policy, um, not based on supply and demand. So your revenues are a little more stable um, and predictable, but they are influenced by the state, in our, in our case, the um, state of our government finances, and then also on the changing laws. So from year to year, depending on law, law changes, you don't know what you're going to get. The role of government in schools, um, under the US Constitution, states are responsible for schools. Uh, the federal government helps to supplement the states in, in funding. But all the states, each state has its own funding method and, and gets to decide how to fund their schools. In Illinois, there are four levels of, of um, educational control. The local level, the school board. The intermediate level, there's a regional office of education. Um, there's different regions throughout the state. The Illinois State Board of Education. Um, and then the Federal Department of Education. So, Governments and schools use what's called governmental accounting or also called fund accounting. Uh, all resources, revenues, obligations, everything is basically um, accounted for in a separate fund. And each fund is an independent accounting entity consisting of self-balancing assets and liabilities. So whereas a corporation will have one set of books, a school district to accomplish, Everything it needs to do can have up to kind of nine sets of books if you want to think about it because each specific purpose has to be segregated and kept track of independently. Revenue and expenditure accounts are the things that most people are familiar with um, and they're the most visible to the community and to the, to the uh, school district employees. Funds are established, as I said, for the purpose of carrying out specific activities. There's a general fund for education, there's uh, debt service funds, there's funds for 
maintain the schools, et cetera. And I'll go through each one individually in a second. Revenues consist of funds that are expected to be available throughout the year to pay for your expenditures. Um, expenditures are the cost of doing business. Now, an expenditure is not necessarily, it's basically when you incur an obligation, you can count it as an expenditure. So if it's a the cost, it's a charge incurred, uh, whether you've paid it yet or not. You also hear a lot of talk about fund balance. Fund balance is just the cumulative effect of surpluses and deficits over the year in your budget. So difference between what you own versus what you owe is your fund balance. It's synonymous or analogous to corporate equity. Um, the annual change in this fund balance is just your budget surplus or deficit. And, uh, but it's not the same thing as cash. Cash would be an asset and your fund balance is kind of your equity that's left over after you subtract from all your assets what you owe people. Fund balance is, um, people are concerned about fund balance because it tells you a lot about the financial health of the school district. Uh, it's recommended that the school district have at least three to five months of operating expenses in fund balance. Uh, in fact, when the state um, gives out its financial ratings, it's a, it only gives the highest rating to um, districts with at least 25% uh, or, or 30%, one th three months of operating uh, expenses in their fund balance. And the majority of school districts, well, the school districts receive the majority of their funds through real estate taxes, and real estate taxes are paid twice a year. So you can imagine if you, as an individual, only got paid twice a year, you'd have to really manage your, your finances in order to make sure that you can meet all your bills. Well, the school district, kind of, if you have a high fund balance, then you have extra money in the bank to help you um, kind of pay all your expenses while you're waiting for your next tax payment. Um, if you don't have a good fund balance, that means you're gonna have to borrow a short term and you're gonna uh, incur a lot of costs in short term borrowing to make it, to make your next payroll basically and take your taxes. Um, additionally, stuff comes up and if you have a strong fund balance, you can handle any unexpected uh, things, expenditures. And lastly, it's, um, it demonstrates financial stability, so it's basically you're a lot more credit worthy. So it improves your credit worthiness to have a strong fund balance, which uh, makes borrowing easier and less costly for the district. Our district has nine funds. These are the nine funds used by the state. Not all districts use every fund. The education fund is kind of, they call it the general fund because this is where you can put everything that is not specifically, that does not specifically have to go into another fund. Operation and maintenance fund is the next fund and it accounts for all costs that of maintaining, improving, and repairing the buildings. Debt service fund is the fund that we use to basically pay the bonds that we issue for our borrowing. Any, um, we also pay long-term leases and um, and any other any other debt or loans that we take. Transportation fund, all of the cost of transporting students is accounted for in this fund. So all the busing and stuff. Municipal Retirement and uh, FICO Fund. This is a fund that uh, is used for paying the retirement benefits of our employees who are um, not certified. So the Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund Pension System uh, is funded out of this fund, and then also Medicare and Social Security, the, the district's portion of Medicare and Social Security that we pay. Capital Projects Fund is for resources that are used for acquisition, construction, improvement of major facilities, so building schools, um, construction projects. The Working Cash Fund is a fund that, um, it's kind of like a savings fund. We can go out and, and get tax money and put it in this fund, and then we're allowed to borrow from this fund to pay expenses, and then we have to repay this fund at, at the end of the year. So we don't have enough um, cash it's, this is something we're borrowing from ourselves. We have this set of money that we hold aside and we can lend it out to all the other funds if they need money to um, do 
do business for the year. The tort fund is used for all risk management. We pay all of our insurance bills and uh, legal and any kind of legal judgments out of this fund. And then the last one up there is the fire prevention and safety fund. All money spent um, for maintaining healthy and safe buildings comes out of this fund. We do a big life safety assessment every 10 years and any uh, anything we need to address as a result of that will we'll come out of this fund. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Bill and talk about the history. As we lead up to showing you what, how Illinois funds education, I thought it would be a good idea maybe to take a step back and, and talk about how we got to the funding that is in this day and age. The first uh, free public schools began in the mid-1800s. Before that, students didn't necessarily have to go to school. A lot of them were homeschooled, a lot of them went to parochial private schools. But in the mid-1800s that they made it mandatory for students to go to school. Here in Illinois, the first public school started in 1825 through the passage of the preschool law. A couple things here, that's when it first started allowing counties to levy taxes. And even today, all of our taxes go to the county. So that is a holdover from that point. It's created common schools in each county, and as a byproduct of that, we now have the regional offices because back in the late 1800s, they created school commissioners to oversee the county schools, and in the mid 1900s to maybe 1960s, then they started consolidating that into the regional offices. And that's where they had 2% of all state income was used to support education. Again, over time, it became apparent that the quality of education was very dependent on the tax wealth of each community. Some were wealthy, some were not. Per people wealth is a measure of the total property value of the district divided by the number of students. So that gives you your per pupil. And again, if you have a high per pupil wealth, that means you have a lot of tax dollars to support education versus some school districts that don't have that high property wealth. And so they struggle sometimes to educate their children. So in the last 20 years, all states have faced these additional pressures because of increasing taxes because the costs are going up. And again, very different spending per pupil per for each district. So states have made an effort to develop equalization kind of formulas to try to smooth out the funding of education. The basic model says each state has each state has a unique model. A lot of the states, over 40 of them, use something called a foundation model. Basically, it says that the state's going to establish a specific amount per student that is raised by either local taxes or what the state's going to provide. And so what they do is they create a tax rate. So every school district has the same tax rate. Whatever you can raise based on that tax rate, based on your property, the state will then fund the difference up to that student. And we'll show you in a minute how Illinois does that. In Illinois uses a modified foundation approach. They guarantee a minimum level of combined state local funding per student. This year it's 6,119 per student. And that's kind of what the legislature has indicated creates a quality education. The reality is it hasn't changed or it hasn't increased kept up with inflation in the years. So it's about $2,500 per student below the federal level. And there is a group here at Wisconsin Education Funding Advisory Board that recommended that it be somewhere in the $8,300 range, but it is only this year the 6119 number. And actually it was a little bit less than that because the state didn't have enough funding for that. And I'll show you that in a few minutes too. In Illinois, there are basically three levels of funding, local sources, state sources, and federal. On average, taxes fund about 50% of education. Again, in our district, that's not the case, but on average, it's around 50%. And again, overall spending power, since it is predominantly based on taxes, spending power is dependent on the wealth. School districts that are viewed as more wealthy, probably, or viewed also have a better education system than districts that aren't viewed as as well. From the local sources of revenue, the property tax is a big one. There's also a corporate tax. 
Then there are some local, what I would call very local sources, you want sales, student fees, investment earnings, rental property that you may have in your building, or you may have other things that you can rent out. And then potentially sometimes educational foundations help support schools. The state level, the big one is the general state aid. And that's what I'm going to go into a little more detail about that in a few minutes. So then there are some categorical aids, special education, transportation, orphanage, then the state lunch and breakfast program. There's also a couple of grants that the state provides, the bilingual grant and the early childhood block grant. So those are some state sources of education. At the federal level, Title I is a big one from the federal government. IDEA, Individuals with Disability Education Act, is another big one. The food program, the National Nutrition Program. Then, we, then the, our district has 21st Century Communities and Learning Centers, Perkins is a vocational technology grant, Medicaid, we have students that are Medicaid eligible. If we provide those services that qualify for Medicaid, then we get reimbursed for that. Then two, there are two recent federal programs that both are expired. One's already expired. The ARA, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, expired. And the Education Jobs Fund, those funding sources will expire at the end of this school year. So the general state aid, I talked about that. That was the biggest of the state funding sources. Basically, it's based on a foundation funding model with three separate components that assures that at least $6,119 per student is available from either state sources or the local tax levy. And here's the three different components of that. If your local resources, again, your local resources are your equalized property value divided by your total students, if that's less than 93%, then you get one formula, and for Round Lake, we're right at 34%. So we're certainly taking advantage of the foundation formula. If you have above 93% of local resources, then you might get 5 to 7% state aid. If you're way on the wealthy side and you have local resources above 175%, then you get, I think, it's $219 per student, not a lot of money. There's also another component of this general state aid formula. That's called the poverty grant component. And this is one that I'll, as we conclude, show you that this is a growing segment of that general state aid calculation, which tends to take the funds that are available and disperse them amongst more school districts. Again, the general state aid formula takes the local resources, convert that into a per pupil, using the attendance data. So that's why the school district is always targeting to ensure that we have all the students we can in school. Because part of this aid form that takes the number of students, it's the equalized assessed value times the set rate that the state has determined. Again, that's not tied to local property tax rates, but it's a set rate for this formula. Then you divide that by the average of the best three months from the prior year. So that's why it is important that students come to school because we need that number to be as high as possible which then makes that per pupil percentage low for us. And again, as I said before, the state aid is inversely proportional to uh, the EAV. So the higher the EAV, the assessed value, property wealth of the community per student, the lower amount of general state aid that you're eligible to receive. And again, we're right at 34% local, so therefore we get a, a higher percentage than other districts from the general state aid. Again, another of the main components of the school district funding is the local pro property tax. And this is the amount of property tax dollars that a school district can request to help operate. And I use the word request. Some states have a form that says, what you don't get in state aid, you get it taxed. Here, it's a little more flexibility. It gets not directly tied to the general state aid formula or the per pupil foundation amount. It's a misconception that, okay, if that's 6119 what the state then give you, the tax is more. In the state of Illinois, the average spending per pupil is about $10,000. So this state aid formula gives you just a fraction of the amount of funding for the state. The components of the tax levy, again, as we kind of talked about, the equalized assessed value, consumer price index, the CPI, the EAV of new property, and this is always a miracle because that information isn't known until late in the process. 
Again, that's a new property. Anytime you improve it, a piece of property, or you have an addition to that piece of property, that's considered new property. And then the tax rate for each fund as a percentage of the equalized assessed value. Those are the components of the tax levy. Again, the tax levy is limited by the state. The school code says that each of these funds that Jay referenced, or I should say the vast majority of the funds that Jay referenced, has a specific rate, and you cannot tax more than what that rate gives you. And again, it's determined by the, for every $100 of property value, it is, you multiply that maximum rate by that, and that gives you what your tax is. And again, in the past, all districts have been able to approve tax levies up to that maximum rate in each given year. But as I said, some funds, transportation, the retirement, and FICA, and the port funds don't have a maximum. So some school districts are able to, if the community supported it, they were able to put more tax dollars into those funds to increase their local funding component. Tax caps. We've probably all heard about tax caps. In 1991, the state implemented the property tax extension limitation law, and it was designed to control the growth of property taxes. But again, it, it controlled your revenue stream, but it didn't necessarily control your expenditure side. Likewise, it also didn't limit what an individual's property taxes could be. It was just the amount of control, the amount of tax that a school district could ask for. And it, it limits the increase of total taxes, which is called extensions. So you hear about tax extension. That is the total tax that a school district is going to receive. It limited that to the lesser of 5% or the consumer price index from the previous year. The exception would be the debt service fund and any of that new property that may come onto the tax rolls. And again, for this year that we're currently in, 1.5% was the CPI. So that means that total tax dollars could only increase by 1.5%. Next year, the CPI that will be used is 3%. And again, that's based on a moment in time each year that they select that number. Now, the local tax cycle. And the reason I mention this is because right now, the Board of Ed, we've adopted a budget. The Board of Education has approved a tax levy. But we don't know what that tax levy is going to be. We won't know that until the next month. Sometime near the end of March, maybe the first part of April. I think we're here today, it may be mid-April before we get some of those numbers. So there is a lag in the property tax cycle, which does impact school districts. The value of property is assessed on January 1st of a given year. But then the taxes on that assessed value doesn't occur till the following year. So on January 11th, you might get your property assessed, but you're not paying taxes on that assessment until June of 2012. The J alluded taxes come twice a year, June and September. So that's when it would be due, June 2012. And again, as I indicated to the Board of Education, they must certify the levy in December for those tax dollars to be used next summer or the next school year. The actual tax levy for 2011, which was then certified by the Board in December, won't be provided until, as I said, late March or April. And that's because it takes them that long to figure out exactly what the multipliers are for each of the communities. Again, tax bills are sent out in May, and taxes are collected in June and September. And for the most part, since the school year concludes, or I should say, from a budgeting perspective, the school year concludes June 30th, if we get taxes in June, they're not really going to be able to use for the school year. So in theory, all taxes collected June and September will be used for the next school year. So now, hopefully that's understandable from the historical perspective of that. Now let's talk about this school district over the last 20 years. Start with the 1990s, talk about the financial oversight that was in place for a number of years. Then we'll start talking about some of the current year's things, what we've done this year, and talk about showing you some of the components of this year's budget. 
Starting in 1990, the district had to issue short-term debt each year to meet operational cash flow needs. When you think of your own household, you get a certain amount of income, you have a certain amount of expenditures, and if you're having to borrow money every year just to make it, or every month just to make it meet, eventually you're going to be struggling because you're not going to be able to pay back all that debt. And so that's sort of what the district found themselves in in, in 1990. In 1992, the state came in and said, we don't like what you're doing financially, so we're going to put you on a watch list and certify that you're in financial difficulty. Again, what that did is require the district to submit financial plans to the state of how they were going to try to get back into a solvent position. Apparently, these plans didn't work, and the district's financial position continued to deteriorate. In 1992, the accumulated deficit, which is each year the, number, the amount of revenue minus the amount of expenses, you're either going to have a positive balance or a negative balance. If you have a negative balance, that's a deficit. So in 1992, they had accumulated a deficit of 2.1 million. In 1999, that had grown to 9.7 million. So from 1992 to 1999, they kept having a deficit balance every year. And what happened in the early spring, the investment banking community deemed the district to be a high risk. And they kept borrowing money year after year, and it didn't look like they were ever going to get into a fi good financial shape. So they said, we're going to stop lending you money. And at that moment in time, in 2000, the district had $14 million of short-term debt, debt that had to be repaid within a 12-month period, which was a very big task. So in the spring of 2000, the state was petitioned by the district for my emergency financial assistance and also to establish that oversight committee. They approved, the board, the state board approved that in May of 2000, and then the oversight panel was able to secure $1.4 million of grants and require that the district have a balanced budget, and again, that was the first balanced budget that this district had in the last 10 years, or the, in over 10 years. The all oversight panel also wanted a study done to figure out how what steps can be taken to help get the district in a good financial position? And what they uh, identified were certain factors that were inhibiting that. One was comparatively small tax base, being that the school district had either low property values or a small community. Also had a very high level of short-term debt, I mentioned 14 million years ago. Again, because of all this, then the bank's not willing to lend money, they didn't have any ability to go out and borrow money from a long-term perspective. Personal costs would continue to rise, as well as the special ed or special needs population was growing as well. So all of these factors made that oversight panel recommend that the district be placed under school financial authority. That was established in August of 2002. Basically what that means, it removes some of the board, current Board of Education's authority, or the local Board of Education's authority, that that finance, that school finance authority, they taxed, they issued debt, they hired the top management, if you remember there was chief education officer, chief financial officer, chief, chief uh, operating officer, all those were back in that 2000 range, and they also approved all the budgets. So, the local board at the time didn't have the authority for these type of issues. As we jump forward to this last year, in February 2011, the school finance authority deemed that the school district had recovered from that financial situation and recommended to the state that that oversight conclude at the end of the last school year. And on June 30th, they approved that effective July 1st, 2011, that that oversight would be gone. So that brought the control, local control, back to the school district. Some of the local or current situations, the district since 2007 has been recognized for their good financial management. I'm going to show you some statistics or some the rankings of that in a few minutes. Again, another thing that has happened in the last couple of years. 2010, a five-year strategic plan was approved by the board, and that implementation began in that school year. For this year, the district's financial profile is in the highest category, 
and our score was a 3.8. The maximum score you can get is a 4. But here are the various components of that financial ranking. Fund balance to revenue ratio. As Jay indicated, fund balance is very important, and the district scored a 4.0 for that. Expenditures to revenue ratio. Make sure you're not having more expenditures in a given year than you have revenue, because then that puts you in a deficit situation. Again, the district scored a 4.0 on that. Days cash on hand. You get a 4.0 if you have 180 days of cash on hand. And again, as Jay indicated, that's important because the revenue stream is not consistent from month to month. And then the percent of short-term borrowing, the district doesn't borrow short-term anymore. So therefore, that's, we have 0%, so therefore, got the highest ranking. Now, the only area that the district didn't score that 4.0 was in long-term debt. And again, to think back to the school district, the district had to borrow money in the early 2000s to recover and to pay off some of these other debts that they had accumulated. So the district's debt margin isn't bad, but it's not in the highest category to get a 4.0 in all these categories. So this was, actually, this is going to be published probably this month or next month. This is the preliminary data that we received from the state. Now, also, this year, because of that control was back, turned back over to the local school board, the Board of Education approved the Finance Committee. And that Finance Committee is comprised of board members and community members. Currently, there are two board members serving on it, and we do have one community member serving on, on the committee. And the purpose of it is to design to assist the board in reviewing and discussing the business and operations components of the district at an in, in-depth level. So it's not discussed it's discussed at the, board, at the board level, but for further information, it's discussed at the committee level. It gets advisory in nature and is charged with fact finding to assist the board. They don't, this committee doesn't approve things, they recommend approval to the Board of Education. Now, I thought I'd go over some of the budget numbers and their statistics for the current year budget that we're in. As you see here this, on this slide, the expansion budget is $82 million. The revenue budget is slightly more $375 positive variance in our budget. And the big difference is we've decided we've added some funding to the life safety, which Jay indicated those are things that we need to do to our buildings. The district has not, because of the financial situation, certain dollars weren't allowed, weren't able to be spent on buildings. So we're trying to create a plan, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, to try to ensure that our buildings are safe for our students. Here's a, a, a chart showing where the revenues are coming from from our operating funds. The state provides around 48% of this year's budget. The local tax levy is around 36%. The federal government is 11%, and that's inflated because of some of those federal, some of those federal stimulus program grants that will be expired in the year. So that's usually around 7% of the budget, but it's inflated this year because of the education jobs money. Then other local revenues account for 5%. So on a local level, you're talking 41%. On a state and federal level, you're talking 59%. From the expenditure side, the district funding is 50%. This is a breakdown of the different components of the district. Special education, 21% of the overall operating budget. Our grants are comprised 10% of the operating budget. Grants are comprised 10% of the operating budget. Food service, 3%. Operations, 7 Transportation, 50%. Again, another slide here is just to give you a breakdown of the state and federal grants. We have about $6.5 million of grants in the district. And here's a breakdown of the various grants that the district has. Again, the federal jobs funds. Again, those are the funds that are going away. The largest percentage, 38%. IDEA, which is a, the federal uh, special needs 
grant, that's 10%. And then you have some other title ones, 23%. And then we have some bilingual component grants on the bottom side here. And we have an after school program, which is 2% of our grant population. So next year, this graph will shift dramatically because that big 38% will be out of the picture. Some of the overview components of this year, the tax levy supports 41% of the budget. Again, 33% is on the operating side, and 7.7% is on the debt service side. And again, that debt service is to repay the outstanding bonds and notes the district has borrowed in the past. And the general state aid is $31 million, and it supports 38% of the budget. Again, the tax levy is projected to be $25 million or an increase of 5.14%. The part of that calculation, we're projecting the value of the district, the property of the district, to go down by 10%. At this point, we won't know what that is until for about another month. But that's what our preliminary projections were. The base extension increased by 1.5%, and the tax rate is 5.2%. The interesting thing here is if that base extension was 1.5, and that's what your tax growth should be, then why is it five, uh, overall 5.14% increase? Again, there's, there's a component that is not part of that tax cap, and that's new property. And Round Lake Beach had a TIF, TIF number two, that expired. So all the property value that was held and not part of the district because of that TIF now came on the tax rolls this year. So therefore, that created a higher than normal tax increase for the district for, the, for this year only. As Jay talked about the fund balance, that's roughly 42% of the operating budget. The official enrollment is about 3,365. 7,200 of those students are educated within the district, and there's 145 students that are educated outside of the district. Some of those, most of those have special needs, but also there's space, we don't have enough space in, in the district. We're at capacity. So therefore, we, we're having to, in the past, we had to send kids to other school districts. Right now, most of them are special needs, but potentially we could have kids go out because of our space. Again, state and federal grants are $6.5 million. And if you add in the carryover, which sometimes some of these grants, if you don't spend the money the prior year, some grants like Title I allow you to carry over your unspent balance for the next year. So with that carryover added in, which we were notified after the budget was adopted, is around $7 million. And keep in mind, it also includes that $2.5 million of the education jobs fund that will be going away at the end of this school year. Staffing costs, 73% of the operating budget. There's 748 positions that have been authorized by the Board of Education and, and included in the budget. And again, we're going to get rid of that 2.5 next year. There's also 44 position, positions within that are being funded by the Education Jobs Fund. So that will reduce probably the overall authorized positions next year. This is a slide showing the enrollment. The enrollment has grown over the last 10 years. I'll show you a slide in a few minutes of how it's going to continue to grow down below. A slide that I presented to the board back in December kind of gave you a visual idea of where a dollar that's provided to us by the tax, by you as a taxpayer, where that dollar is spent. 85% are spent on the students. 2% are spent on supporting the students, or 2 cents. 7 percent, 7 cents is goes towards operating and maintaining our buildings. And then we have 6 cents towards the central services, the fiscal component, the IT component, and those services that are provided to all of the schools. That's 6, six cents. So that is a dollar well spent. Now for the last component, is talk a little bit about developing next year's budget. We've already started that process. And I'm going to get, go over briefly just globally what budgeting is, talk about the timeline for the district, then talk about where, where we are right now in our budget projections and what we're planning, what, if you will, what is in the future for the district, either what we have control over and what we may not have control over. 
get for those that aren't familiar, budgeting is a sequence of activities. First, you have to plan what you want to fund, what your educational programs are. Then you need to estimate what you need to fund those programs, and that's what your expenditures are going to be. Then you need to identify what revenue sources you have to help cover those expenses because you want to have a balanced budget. And then you use that budget after it's been approved by the Board of Education to manage the district operations, hold people accountable for their budget allocations. And normally, a framework for the budgeting process is based on either a strategic plan or goals. That's what I would say to a school principal. You have goals for your school for next year, that's what your budget should be based on. Not just what it was last year or where you pick out of the sky where you want to spend money. It needs to be based on a plan. Some good principles of budgeting. This district should have good policies and procedures in place. And where you think fund balance should be, so you don't go below that policy that the board has approved. Some districts also have policies that say what class size is going to be. In our collective bargaining agreement, it indicates what the class size is. Also, you may have policy on what programs you want to offer. Then you may have policies on what's the priority for maintenance and repair, how much money you may want to spend on technology. These may not be formal board policies, but there are practices and policies that you have to guide your budget. And that's always going to involve citizens and stakeholders. And this is done in a variety of ways, public meetings, we have the uh, public hearings, finance committee is open to the public, but it provides the public an opportunity to understand more about the budgeting process, be involved in that, as well as give them a better understanding of what the school district is trying to accomplish. And then it's also important to have fair and consistent allocation of resources. You want to make sure that if you're giving one school an allocation, it needs to be something very based on the same formula that you're giving another school, so you're not giving one school more than another. And that's very important when you start looking at the federal side, because Title I wants to make sure everything is very comparable. They don't want to give you the federal funding if you're going to not allocate those funds equitably through each of the schools. Just an overview of the budgeting process, again, develop policies and guidelines. The next step, figure out what your enrollment's going to be next year. That helps in determining what your staffing needs are going to be, or even your space requirements. If your enrollment's going to balloon, you're going to be able to even have to house these students somewhere. Then also is used to project potential funding changes. You're going to have less students than you planned. If you're going to buy textbooks next year, and all of a sudden now your enrollment projections is less, you don't need to spend as much money for textbooks potentially. So it helps you in a variety of ways. And the next step is to figure out what your revenues are going to be, and also well, figure out what your expenditures are going to be. And we're kind of in that process right now. And then after that, you make sure you balance the budget, because it's good budgeting practice to have a balanced budget. Then you will present it to the Finance Committee and the Board of Education. If there's any questions or still variances out there, we'll say we don't have a balanced budget, when we present that first budget to the board, then we'll spend some time working through issues with the Finance Committee and with the Board of Education to create that balanced budget, hold a public hearing in September, as well as the board will approve the budget in September as well. Just from Round Lake's perspective, I have it laid out here month by month. We may not go through all these components too, but we've done the estimating of the student enrollment. We're in the process of estimating the staffing needs. We've talked about it in the superintendent's cabinet. We've talked about it with our administrators. We will be sending out budgets to our sites. Let them build their budgets based on an equitable formula. In May, we're going to present the preliminary budget to the finance committee and then hold meetings in May and June. June, present a plenary budget to the board. In August, we're going to find, firm up those numbers in June, from June to August, and we're going to present a tentative budget in August. And then September, hold a public hearing and adopt the budget. Then there's another component after you adopt the budget, and that's calculating what the tax needs are going to be for the next year. So that happens in October, November, and December. And in December, the board certifies the tax level. And again, then the process starts all over again for the next year. So it's a full 12-month cycle. The 
some of our budgeting budget assumptions for the 2012-2013 budget. Our enrollment was projecting that to go up by 82 students. And that is based on Fannie Howie, the architect of record for the district, did a 10-year enrollment projection back in 2010. We took their numbers as a baseline and we just updated it based on the current <coughs> enrollment of the district. And that gives us an 82 student projection. We're also projecting some of our revenues to decrease. Number one, I told you that Round Lake Beach TIF, that also provided us a million dollars a year of surplus for the TIF, and I'm not going to go into the explanation of the TIF, but we were providing a million dollar surplus. That's going to go away because that TIF is expired. We also have to take out the Education Jobs Fund, which is another $2.5 million. Our general state aid is going to go up, but the uncertainty at the state level, we're being conservative and we're reducing what we think the state aid is going to be by 10% right now. It may go, it may change, and that may be changed positive for us, hopefully, but then it may change negatively as well. Categorical aid, there's other revenue sources from the state. From the last several years, they have there's they pay every quarter. So there's four payments a year for let's say transportation aid. For the last several years, they've only been making three of those payments because of the funding at the state level. There is no funds, and you know they're having cash flow problems. So they've only made three. So we're continuing to budget only three of those four payments. And as we talk about next year's budget, the consumer price index for the tax component projected to increase 3%. And then we also think through some things we're doing from the health side, we're able to increase Medicaid revenue. And that's not a large budget increase, but at least it's a budget increase on the revenue side. From the expenditure side, we're estimating the staffing costs are going to increase between 3 and 5% of staffing costs. Again, that's because there's a current collective bargaining out there, and it includes lanes and steps for those groups that have lanes and step increases. Right now, we're projecting health insurance to increase by 10%. The initial indication is going to be something close to that 10%. Dental premiums, we're projecting that to be a 5% increase. And there's going to be other benefits that the district provides that is based on salary. So those have to increase. If your salary is going to increase, those components have to increase a little bit as well. We're projecting, and we haven't, but we haven't gotten any further information, that that special education tuition for those 145 students that go outside the district, that that's going to increase as well. So we've projected 5% right now. Then we've just built in about a 2% increase on the other things. Utilities, we're projecting those to go up 5%. The price of gas for recently, that may be a low in percentage increase right now. So in total, we're projecting our revenues to decrease by $1.2 million. And again, here's the rationale. Due to the TIF increase into the education jobs money being taken out. But to offset that, for the most part, we're projecting real estate aid increase. But we're also projecting that to not increase as much as we thought, but it doesn't, it's not increasing enough to offset the negatives. We're projecting our staff increase to go up, our expenditures go up 2.6, primarily due to staffing costs. So right now, before we really start looking at anything, $3.8 million deficit before we start looking at staffing needs. Once we get the staffing need projections at back and things like that, that number will certainly change. But before any of that is factored in, this is kind of just our initial snapshot and so our goal is to reduce that 3.8 from a variety of ways. And we have the next three months to, to make that happen. So what's the future hold for the school district? It's said here most, as we all probably know, because you've listened to the news, state and federal funding is shrinking for everybody, including education. The stat I saw was 37 states provided less funding this year than last year. And there are no more federal stimulus funds. That's dried up. And just I also saw Illinois reduce funding by 12.9% this fiscal year. That's one of the highest of all the states, higher than Wisconsin. And with Illinois continues to be near the bottom of all states in the fairness of school funding, this is 
what some folks are indicating out there because we're not providing, the state doesn't provide money to education in the right places. Not to, it doesn't provide it to the school districts and the local. Again, as I indicated earlier, the state has been meeting with their obligations for the general state aid. And again, that's been helped in the last several years because the state gets federal stimulus money that they use to help repurpose it back to the school districts through the general state aid. When I told you the 60, you know, we looked at that foundation, it was 6119, $6,119. The reality is the state did give that as their formula. They reduced it by 2.7% to get to 5953. So that sort of was the actual per pupil foundation level, even though their published rate or amount was 6119. We're projecting that to increase slightly. At least that's what the group of the talk is out there. I mean, like 5973 is what they're suggesting it might be. But again, the formula out there still bases it off of that 6119. Again, as I indicated earlier, the categorical grants are not being paid in time. So all these factors are what we have to prepare for moving down over the next two or three years. And the governor released his budget last week, I believe, and didn't increase any money for K-12. There are rumors out there that the legislature is going to try to find money for preschool, bilingual, and special needs programs somewhere. The problem is, without the overall increase in K-12 funding, the money has to come from somewhere. They may take away from general state aid, as well as general state aid is also being reduced because when we talk about the general state aid formula, there's two components. There's the foundation calculation, then there's a poverty component. And with the current state of the economy, more and more districts are becoming, are having higher poverty. So those dollars, flat amount for general state aid is being dispersed over more districts. So that's creating a situation where if you're scheduled to get X, you may get something lower than that because they're getting, spreading money, same pot of money over more school districts. So we don't really know what that's going to be for another two or three months. There's also some pending legislation out there that may negatively impact school districts. We talked about the tax cap. The formula says your taxes are going to either go up by up to 5%, CPI or up to 5%. That's if your value of your property goes up or goes down. There are some folks out there that says if your property value is going down, you should have no tax increase at all. And so there is some legislation out there that, that was legislation from last year as well. It didn't pass last year, so who knows what's going to happen this year. And there's also some uncertainty out there because there are some folks saying that the state's obligation for pension plans need to be transferred to the local school districts. I'm not sure where either of these two components are going to be, but if they do pass, it could be a negative financial hardship for the school district. So now what's ahead for the school district? Again, as I indicated earlier, the district is growing. It continues to grow at about 1% per year. And here's a chart that over the next 10 years, where enrollment may go, almost up to 8,500 students. And these are based off the Fannie Howey projection. So as that enrollment continues to increase, again, that's putting pressure on our ability to house and educate our students. So therefore, infrastructure needs are going to be a big issue. And the Board of Education has engaged Fannie Howey, an architect, to create a facilities master plan. And for the next two or three months, that's going to be discussed as we try to figure out a way to help educate our students moving forward. Here within the district, we're not having to ship students outside the district and pay another district to educate our own students. Another thing we're going to be doing this month and next month is looking at refunding some prior debt. Remember when I talked about how the school district was in a very high risk situation? They were able to borrow money after the oversight came in, but they were paying astronomical interest rates. Interest rates set at 6%, 7%. We can refinance some of those now at what the current interest rate is, 2% to 3%, and save the district some money. 
So we're going to be looking at doing that uh, to try to help save some funds down the road. Another thing that we have to be very conscious of is the future. And if you see the red and the blue lines here, the blue line represents the projected revenues over the next five years. And you see the drop from the current year to next year, that's because of the TIF coming off and the education funds leading. Then there's a year of sort of flat, and then the revenues are projected to grow. We're kind of hoping that the state recovers and are projecting the state to recover and start making the four payments as well as funding the full general state aid. So that's, we're giving that a couple of years, if and also from a tax perspective because of the property values, hope that they'll, it's gonna take a few years for those to recover, but hopefully they'll recover. But the red line out there is expenditures. And again, as I talked about for the next year's budget, for the next two years, a lot of the staffing costs have already been determined by the collective bargaining agreement, but still projecting that the expenditures will increase. So that kind of gives us a budget deficit that we have to work on. Again, since I want to say that those are firm projections of budget deficits, but that is just something that we have to be mindful of as we move forward and make our decisions, that we're not talking about just this year. We've got to talk about two to three years down the road, put ourselves in a good position this year, so we're not having to come back and say we're going to cut $5 million two years from now. So this is just kind of a quick and dirty projection over the next five years of where we think without any changes. It either just, if we do nothing based on past trends, this is where it will be in five years, almost a $10 million deficit. So with that, uh, thank you all for being here. And then, after tonight, if you have questions, you can know, contact the business office. And at this point, we'll turn it over to any questions you may have for JRI or the Board of Education. Okay, we're going to, uh, our microphones uh, are not working as we'd like for them to. So we're going to ask if you have a question that you would like to ask, if you would raise your hand so that we can be sure that we don't have two or three people talking at the same time. And then uh, if you want to address the question to either Bill or Jay, and I want to thank them for the fine job that they did sure. in uh, sharing this information with us. Or if you would like to uh, address your question to anyone who is sitting here, uh, please feel free to do so. And so I think that, uh, for Jan, I think I saw your hand go up first. And if you could just talk loud so everyone can hear you, that would be helpful. I have a few questions. When you talk about the TIF, um, I know that Round Lake Beach got a TIF this year. So is that the TIF you're talking about, or are you talking about the ending of the TIF that you got the money for? The immediate impact is the ending of the TIF number two. So what's the what impact? One of my questions is what's the impact of the new TIF on the district? What the impact of the new TIF will do is it'll wherever the boundaries of that tip are, it'll freeze the property values in that boundary. So if we're in a situation where property values are increasing, which then benefits the community because the higher the property values are, the lower the tax rate. So the negative for the short term is that those property values are frozen. So you still would get some, you still we'll, get some whatever tax money from those properties, it's just you don't get it if it goes on. Yes. Um, my other question, or one of my other questions was, on one of the slides you had um, capital projects and it was a red number of almost 600,000. Is that this year? Is that next year? I wasn't clear. 600,000? It looked like you had three columns of numbers and the impact was 600,000. It was, there, there was some money left over from a prior bond offering that the district has been using, and there was about $100,000 left in it. And the projection is we may have $1,000 of interest earnings, and then $99,000 we're going to get. We're going to expend the balance to try to get that down to zero, and that's where the funding of 
the uh, architect, their services admit that's what the expenditures are projected for this year to expend to get rid of those those funds. So it was a minus ninety nine thousand. It was a minus. In response to Mrs. Kirby's inquiry, administrative salaries from 2010 to the current school year over the last two years saw a change, uh, an increase of $473,000 or an increase of 17.9%. There was an increase of six administrators from the 2009-2010 school year to the 2011-2012 school year. <clears throat> which is an increase of 22.22%. So I hope that answers your question, Mrs. Kirby. Thank you. I, I do have another question. Um, the increase in salary, I'm wondering what the district has done to check on the Danny Howie report. We had several um, reports done from the district over the past, well, I've been involved with the district for what, 30 years? Over the past years, and they've not always been, in fact, most of them have been very inaccurate. Have you looked at the Ben Howie uh, report and determined the reliability of the figures that they have uh, projected for you? Uh, not at this point. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Gerber. I have a question regarding the uh, Finance Committee. Um, you talked about that you wanted board members, community members involved. And when you put out the request to the community, uh, four people applied to be on the finance committee. Um, one person was accepted. One person applied late after the deadline, so they were taken out of the pool. A second person was accepted and they declined, they withdrew, and then there was myself who applied and never heard anything, not a word. Not a phone call, not an email, 
Nothing. So then they put out, the district put out another request for the finance committee. And I, as a community member, applied again within the time limits. And it was about a month afterwards that I received a letter from Dr. Collins. And the letter said, excuse me as I pick it up here, said the Round Lake Area School Community District 116 Board of Education received your letter of interest dated December 15th. This letter was written to me January 13th. Regarding the second posting of the Finance Committee vacancy, please be advised that due to the fact that no new letters of interest were received following this posting, the Board of Education has decided not to fill the Finance Committee vacancy for the remainder of the school year. Thank you for your continued support of Round Lake Area School District 116. Sincerely, Constance Collins. How can I continue to support the school district when having lived here for 16 years, 20 years in education, you didn't interview me, you didn't interview anybody, and you just picked and chose who to put on the committee and decided not to put on the committee. I guess my question to you is, what was your rationale? Why did you do this? How did you come to this? And why don't you want certain community members involved in the schools? Why are you, I guess, for lack of better terminology, being prejudiced against some community members versus others about being involved in the school and on the finance committee when you had no one else, absolutely nobody else applied? Then why was it when the first notice went out, I was never contacted? It took from the first notice went out in August, maybe early September. I wasn't contacted until January. So I find I find what you're saying a little bit tough to swallow 
because it looks to me as a community member, as someone who's lived here, has lived this, both as an employee and as a resident, that you're picking and choosing. And you're picking and choosing to get what's done what you want done, and that you don't want to hear any other voices out in the community. You just want to hear the voices you want to hear. And I guess my, my, my pointed question is, why was there no communication, nothing done between September and January?
who's made the decision for us, for our kids. Like right now, I think you are the big uh, council, you are the chef, you are the one who made, like these people, I don't know who these people is. They want to talk and I know these people, they know that stuff, that's, it's like a number that stuff to know. And it's good because, like I said, if you have like a website, you go and check it out everything. Because it's better to check it out about these seven companies. A lot of the information is on the website. We also have board meetings uh, at least mm -hmm. twice a month, not more often. Uh, so therefore, and the board meetings are open to the public, and that is a way for parents as well as community members to find out what's going on in the district. In fact, that's one of the purposes, and that's why those are public meetings, because we want parents, we want community members to come to the board meetings so that they know what's going on. Uh, my role is as superintendent, and even for our parents, we did do an honor call also. Did you receive? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Like, like I said, I speak for my people, yes. my parents, people. We need to come up with it to see this. Yes. We need, but also some people that don't speak English, so they have to use that. We have and I'm, I'm right. going to do that because I'm the kind of person they want, want to know what's going on. Yes, we, have, we always have translators. We have a translator who's working with a group of parents up there at the top. We even have another translator who's present in the audience. So we are aware of the needs of our community. And so we always uh, try to have someone available to assist in translating what's being said. Uh, but here again, through our all call, as well as our board meetings, are another way to find out what's going on in the district, because we always have financial reports at those meetings, as well as talking about what's going on in the area of teaching and learning. Um, and also, really, transportation, all areas uh, that the district has responsibility for. We also have students who uh, present and uh, also share at our board meetings. All of our schools, at one time or another, have shared during uh, the year what's happening in the schools, how they're doing as far as student achievement is concerned, et cetera. So the board meetings are really the forum, the regular meetings that take place where it's an opportunity for our parents. And we would love to have more parents and community members come to our board meetings, because that's where the discussions take place. This is a meeting, uh, as I indicated, we scheduled three forums throughout this year. These are extra meetings because we wanted to have an opportunity to, another opportunity for parents and community members to come, in addition to our regular board meetings, to hear about what's happening in the school. But I would invite anyone to come to any of our scheduled board meetings which are regular meetings twice a month to hear about what's going on and so that uh, you can find out the information firsthand. Uh, as far as the board members, I'll ask that the board members introduce themselves so that you know who they are. I apologize that we didn't do that before we started. But these are all of our uh, board members. Like a brief history of the meeting? Sure. Can you tell us something about Yeah, just give you a quick brief history. Because I really want us to, uh, we've got 10 minutes left is the, um, the finances, so I really want to make somebody else to have an opportunity, but we can take a few moments to go and have a little bit of a My name is Douglas Rowe Williams, and I've been on the board since 2009. Um, no, I don't have children in the school district, but I belong to about five or six different committees that deal with children, so not having children is really uh, not important to me because it's my community, and if our children do well, we all do well, and that is property values and perception of the community. So uh, of any school district, 75% of the taxpayers usually don't have children in the school district. They're at a large population, so 25% are usually parents. So the non-children families really are just as important because they fund the other 25%. My name is Mike Leckhardt. Uh, I've been in the community since I was one.
beginning of this year, uh, it's actually last year, this school year. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like that came up, and I, I thought it was a good opportunity for me to get involved and help me get that difference in the district and in the communities. And that's why I came to work here. My name is Lori Wines
doing a lot of searching, uh, you know, near and far to find out where there is some possible land, where there are some vacant facilities, just what we can do, how we can reorganize. That's why we're also working with our uh, facilities, uh, the company Fannie Howard, which is the architectural firm that uh, we work with, which every school district is required to have an architect of record on file. And we're working with them to really explore and find out where is there some space, even what we can do with our existing facilities. We are over capacity here in the high school, which is why we have two schedules for our students to come to school. Some come first through eight, some come second through ninth, because we don't have the space to accommodate all of our students. So we are having those conversations. Uh, Bill is also in charge of uh, facilities. We have our buildings and grounds director, who is uh, Charlie, who's here um, on the third row. And they are all working with the board, with myself, to explore what the options are, uh, to see if we can find uh, somewhere where we can expand uh, in order to accommodate our students. Because as I said, presently, we're already over capacity. And we know that that's only going to get worse as time goes on. We want to make the best decision for the kids. We're not going to make it overnight. We're going to gather all the information that we need before we make that decision. Is because it has to be long term. Is there a point where you're going to have to make the decision to look at moving kids? I mean, like how long do you just keep saying we're overpopulated? At what point do you say we can't meet the kids' needs? Did you say moving solicit, kids? Solicit help from other districts. Uh, no, we will not send our kids. We don't want to send our kids to other districts. We have solicited help in other places. And we have got to resolve the problem because we're responsible for educating our children. So we have to resolve that. And so these are conversations that we have started having within the last, but since our strategic plan was developed. Well, I mean, Is 
status proxy board positions, or is that something that's still in discussions on how that is going to be handled? That is, uh, we have not come to the board with all of that, so that is something that is still in discussion. However, again, let me just sort of uh, respond also. Uh, as Bill shared, uh, the grants which are expiring, uh, many of those positions are, the 44 that we're talking about came from the grants. And so therefore, as those grant dollars are expiring, then we're having to take a look at uh, either what else would pay for some of those positions, meaning other grants, et cetera, versus which ones we're not able to sustain and maintain uh, once the grant dollars are gone. And out of the 748 positions, how many of those are actually teaching positions that interact with the children? We have approximately 450 teaching positions. Pardon? 100 teaching assistants, in addition to that 450 teachers. It is now after uh, 8.30 and I had I'm sorry, Jeannie, did you have another question? I did, but I thought I saw another hand in there. Oh, okay. Okay. This will be the last question. I just, uh, I, I wanted to say you did a very nice job of overview of the complicated aspects of school finance. It's just very hard for a lot of people to yes. wrap their brains around it. You did a very nice job of that. Um, I thought this was in the flyer that I received. I thought this was going to be an opportunity to actually get more into detail the budgeting for the next fiscal year. And um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, if you're going to have the public meetings, are you going to allow the public to participate in those meetings, in the finance committee meeting, and if it comes to the board meeting, those questions? And will you have that participation before the meetings or after? All school, all school board meetings have public comment. Um, I would say to you that public comment is really not a time for discussion, but what would happen is if you have a comment, we will direct someone to address that outside of the school board meeting. So whatever your concerns are, we find someone to address that outside. Otherwise, we would be in discussion still the meeting. It takes about a year. So it, it, are you understanding? Yeah. So you bring, yes, you bring, bring, the, bring the questions that you have.
until they can meet and have that conversation. Okay? Yes, Veronica is going to get up there. Yes. She's going to meet. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. We appreciate it and uh, for coming out to our